to the mysteries of megalithic structures around the world? Is there a pattern, a construction method, or a clue left by these ancient builders, a thread of evidence that wraps around the world? Could they have been creating a network of power centers that we are only discovering today? Evidence continues to emerge that there once was an ancient civilization that built tremendous structures here. Apparently, many were giants, and most of the bones that were collected over the centuries have been lost to us, whether accidental or intentionally. In fact, we are often prevented from even reading ledgers about their discovery, even though they were routinely reported in many newspaper articles in the 1800s. But if we still could find one more spot, one special location where unspoiled evidence could be examined, then that place had to be found. We discovered that the only place we could go was Peru. Peru is a South American country, and it's about 4,150 miles to Lima from the Los Angeles International Airport. Lima is a sprawling coastal city with traffic that would compete with rush hour in LA and a population of nearly 8 million. With us is Dr. Judd Burton, a historian, anthropologist, and archaeologist. Judd's expertise on examining the artifacts we hope to find is crucial to the trip. Since we plan to examine elongated skulls, we needed Judd's trained eye. Joe Taylor, the curator from Mount Blanco Museum in Texas, is an expert on casting bones and making a reproduction in great detail. This helps the study to continue long after we leave Peru. Both Joe and Judd were featured in Watchers 4. Ron Moorhead is an adventurer and a private pilot that has flown all over the world. He's an author and an expert on Bigfoot and was interested in the Peru trip because of the theory about ancient giants. Could the two be somehow related? Director Richard Shaw has been linked to the Watchers series from the beginning. The series seems to have no end in sight, but it's Richard's eye for the unusual, along with his unique editing style that gives Watchers its look and feel. Richard and L.A. co-produce each Watchers. L.A. Marzulli was nearly beside himself with enthusiasm on this trip. It was the culmination of a lifelong dream to be able to study what might be actual remnants of the Nephilim, the giants that were on the Earth at the time of Genesis 6. Peru was one of the last places on Earth where this discovery might be possible. Our guide is Brian Forrester. Brian is not your average tour guide with a rehearsed spiel at every location. He is an author, and his theories on the ancient stones and skulls in Peru fly in the face of the established dogma about these artifacts. We nicknamed him El Sadistico because he enjoyed the grueling hikes he took us on at altitudes in excess of 12,000 feet. The first leg of the trip landed us in Lima, where we all met at the Vista del Sol Hotel. We spent a little time talking about what we'd eventually see in Paracas, and Brian filled us in on the enigmatic nature of the ancient Paracas and how they mysteriously appeared. So the Paracas suddenly just appeared out of nowhere. Could they be remnants of Phoenicians? Any, any Phoenician type connection at all? Uh, not that we know of so far. The thing is that they, uh, you know, uh, Again, they practice cranial deformation amongst their royalty only. We headed out to see the elongated skull collection at Peru's National Museum, which was supposed to be quite extensive. The entire section of the museum that normally displayed the skulls was all boarded up. The walls actually sealed off with new drywall in the exhibit was closed. Well, it's weird. It's just, it's, it's very progressive the way that this display happens to be shut down. It's always the, 
mysterious culture displays that are being shut down as we go. Um, but that's why we have access to the private museums because mm -hmm. thank goodness there is no juris so, direct jurisdiction. So the last time you were here was what about a month ago? Last time you November, were here, yeah. November. Okay, November. so several months back, yeah. and it was open, and the, the skulls, elongated skulls, were still on display. Yeah, yeah. and now we come here and. This whole thing is being renovated, and we've got two, two guards here, one there and one here. Oh, the other thing is that that guy, especially because the bathrooms are through there, and if you str that's where the warehouses are. If you stray a tiny bit, they freak out at you. The Ivy League universities are the old boys' clubs. Yes, that's right. They're in charge of everything, so they're, they're in charge of it's history. Going, it's going bones. The road from Lima took us through incredibly diverse landscapes from the outskirts of Lima all the way to the little coastal town of Paracas. The drive took all afternoon, but we all became enraptured with the beauty of Peru, the simple lifestyles we saw there. We learned that Peru is pretty much self-sufficient, growing lots of food and needing little outside assistance. We were able to stop long enough to visit an abandoned beach, where we wondered at the deserted and crumbling houses there. Beachcombers and motorcycles continue to come and go and enjoy the Pacific Ocean in these odd, yet artistic surroundings. Then, it was back on the road again through little towns where three-wheel taxis were in constant demand. A torturous and circuitous drive with many pit stops and uh, explorations. We arrive at our hotel in downtown Paracas. We arrived at Paracas and we were exhausted. But we had to go to the museum to see if the elongated skulls that we had traveled thousands of miles to see were actually there. When we arrived, to our astonishment and delight, we saw the skulls, and to make it even more incredible, we were able to touch them, weigh them, handle them, and photograph them. And as far as I'm concerned, that was unprecedented. We're here at the Paracas Museum uh, in Paracas, Peru. <laughs> I pitched myself making sure I'm still here. This is Senior Juan, who has collected all of these artifacts at this museum. Senior Juan, thank you for being here. And that is our Irene, our interpreter. What's interesting, and we've talked about this, why would a culture um, emulate this shape? What is so important about the shape that a culture would emulate it and take its young children and create this shape through cranial deformation or cradle? He believed uh, one reason could be like, they could imitate their ancestors, the wisdom of their ancestors, the wisdom of the ancestors. The wisdom of the ancestors. Yeah. One reason could be like, and we don't only see elongated heads in Peru, we also see them in Egypt and any other parts yes. of the world. And he believed could be that the aliens do. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. The concept is, is that when Joshua and Caleb went into what is known as the promised land of the Levant, there was a diaspora, the giants, the remnants of the giants, the Nephilim, the Raphael, the Zemzumim, all these different tribes, some of them fled northward and southward. Is it possible, the hypothesis is, is it possible that they built ships and literally came to South America? And the timeline from these skulls apparently are about 3,500 years. So it, it or actually less, 2,800 years. So it, it fits the timeline of a diaspora. And it makes one wonder whether these are the descendants somehow of a Nephilim. We're going to show you a little bit later what we believe is a possible female Nephilim skull. Now I say Nephilim, I don't know whether it is or not. Now that we have DNA results um, from around Peru, uh, a German paper published two years ago stated emphatically that the coastal people, including the Paracas mm -hmm. from 2,000 plus years ago, mm -hmm. are not genetically related to the highlands. And so since we are right on the ocean here, and these people occupied this area for at least 800 years. Mm -hmm. This is the most beautiful natural bay on the coast of Peru. Yes. This would be the perfect place for a seafaring culture to land and establish a society. And so the other thing is that 
Chavin, which is where most people, archaeologists, think that the Paracas came from, they didn't perform cranial deformation. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. it's unlikely that a society would move from the highlands of Peru and suddenly start binding their children's heads mm -hmm. for unknown reasons. But we also see a difference between um, the skull that, that Senior Wam was holding, which was which was cradle boarding. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's what we believe anyway. And then we look at this skull here and this skull here, right. which we believe are examples uh, that are not cradle boarding. And if Judd Burton is around, we can bring in Judd and have him weigh in on this too. So Judd, the skull we're looking at um, here, again, this is not an example of, of cradle boarding or deliberate cranial deformation. This has been, uh, again, we see a large frontal plate and apparently there's there's no there's one one uh, parietal here, not two. The suture does not go back in a very um, and just and just the occipital. So uh, very yep. very strange looking skull. Uh, upon further examination, yeah, I mean the, the again the suture patterns are, are all wrong mm -hmm. for what you would see in a, norm, a normal normal, human. Ho normal Homo sapiens. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, this skull also also displays the same sorts of uh, anomalies that we've been discussing here. Uh, but one of, the, one of the things that's interesting to me about the, the skull that Senior Juan has here is we may very well be looking at, at emulation. They're wanting to, to emulate right. their, their ancestors. What is, what is this that you're holding in your hand? What is this that you're holding in your hand, Senior Juan? Here I have a deformer Para la, la deformación artificial de los cráneos. This is one of the instruments that the Paracas use um, for the cranial deformation. Can you show us on this skull how it would work? Podría enseñarnos sí. cómo funciona eso. Ponía la parte acá atrás. This would uh, create a very rigid area, which then you bind the head and it would, it would keep it. Um, well, it would deform it. Amazing. How old is this? Tiene más de 2000 años. Es más de 2000 años. 2000 años. Wow. Wow. Thank you so much for allowing us to, to handle the artifacts. Okay, I'm going to start the first coats of latex in the eye sockets and the zygomatic arch with uh, rubber latex mold material, pure latex, so that it, uh, it's the best case for doing this stuff. I got a brand new clean brush, and uh, here we go. I'm gonna make sure I don't get so much in there that it can't dry. I don't want to get too much inside the little hole that I can't feel there. So my first coat's gonna be sketchy. Now I'll do it as, as soon as the next one gets dry. I'll do that again. Do it again. So that covers the clay. All right, that's the start. So here we have four skulls lined up. These two here are what we believe are human skulls that have been deformed through cradle headboarding. You'll notice this skull in particular, how the, the skull is not really very symmetrical and how the sutures, because the skull has been compressed, are, are clearly visible, more visible to the eye. Notice also that the two parietal here, frontal, two parietal, occipital in the rear, frontal, two parietal, occipital. This skull here, frontal, let's skip to the very end, frontal, one parietal, no suture down the middle. This skull here, frontal, and only one parietal. So we have a definite anomaly. These skulls here seem to be emulating this skull here. So I think that's why we're looking at this one as an example of one that could possibly be natural in that the child may have been born this way. Also you can't see from the camera angle at the moment but at the back there's a very a very heart shape so that it's as if the two... Can we rotate the skull? Sure. It's, it's as if the two hemispheres are distinctly shown because you see there is a bump here, depression, and then a bump there. So let me move, the, move this up a little bit. And that would be something very difficult to achieve with a simple cradle boarding or um, deformation technique. Most of the skulls in the museum and in most collections are hairless because they are 
when they're brought into the museum, uh, some museums for some reason decide that they want to sterilize the skull and bleach them and clean them. In the example uh, that we have here, this one had the hair at already attached. Unfortunately, some of it, there was more, but it fell off. Mm -hmm. But this clearly is the hair from this individual. And it's the color, which is so very intriguing, because again, it's the, uh, this auburn reddish you really look. really see it right there. Yeah, you really it's, see it. Which is not a characteristic of most Native American people in North America, South America, or Central America. Also, I've had experts look at the hair, and they have said there is no evidence of dye or bleaching or coloration, mm -hmm. that this is the color of the hair of the person when they were alive 2,000 years ago. So the major question is, where would that red or auburn hair uh, have come from in terms of ancestry? Brian, why, why are there bones all scattered everywhere, as far, almost as far as the eye can see? I've never been, I, I can't, I'm having trouble getting my head around it, literally. I've never seen anything like this. Well, it's literally beyond as far as you can see. This graveyard, according to Senior Juan, goes seven miles in that direction. Wow. And starts with the Paracas, which is the oldest culture, all the way up until the Inca. Mm -hmm. And it's just that because it's a graveyard, people have been plundering for 500 years the tombs. Some of them are buried very deep. Senior Juan said, or you said that, 24 feet or, 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 or deeper than that? The royal Paracas were buried that deep, but wow. um, where we're going to go as we walk is we'll go to what's left of a Paracas village. And okay. there, I have found remains of elongated skulls. Wow. So hopefully today we'll see some evidence of that. As well. Essentially, this has been untouched. Well, it's been looted, but it's, it's we're looking at a what a, a, a three thousand year old burial tomb here, burial grounds. At least two thousand. Yeah. At least two thousand. Possibly three. Possibly. Uh, the deeper you go, the more you can find. As far as I know, there have been no there have been no scientific excavations here. Uh huh. So uh, there is no scientific study as to how large it is and how old it is. And the reason why we're here is because Senior Juan has grown up in this area and knows of the area and, and we have a sort of a special way in and that no one would ever find. Is that is that sort of true or, I mean, we're, we're privileged to be here because of Senior Juan. Well, very much so, we have permission. This is, this huge cemetery is private property. Wow. Including the pyramid in the back. <laughs> <laughs> Most other countries you don't find that. Uh, but because Peru has such a rich history and basically the entire country is an archaeological site that some people can't have things like pyramids, tombs, etc. on their private Unbelievable. property. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. Well, you saw in the museum uh, in Paracas the little baby uh -huh. and the elongated and skull mother and supposedly the uncle as well that had red hair. Okay. 
their bodies are actually under under this mound. Wow. So this is probably this may be the uh, the tibia, I, I believe it is, right. of the of the mother. But um, you know, we aren't allowed to to dig up remains. So I I honestly I tripped over that. So the bodies are here. Hopefully, at some point, we'll be able to get an archaeologist to come and do a proper uh, excavation of this. And from that, we'll be able to reassemble an elongated skull's body, or maybe even two of them. Well, we were just walking along. And here we find a slingshot from the Wadi culture lying on the ground. This is at least 1,000 years old. So it's just amazing what you can find. Um, what's been left behind by the grave robbers or Wakeros. Uh, they're only looking for silver, gold, and, and pottery. And so things like this mean nothing to them. Unfortunately, by leaving them on the ground like this, they just fall apart. So this is a museum specimen that I guess we just return to the earth now. So what are we looking at here, Brian? What are those posts that look like posts. We're probably, what, a uh, quarter of a mile, half a mile away, something like that? Yeah, this was a royal graveyard of the Paracas people. The vertical markers were put there probably in the between the 1920s and 1960s in order to establish where the graves are. Okay. But they're very deep graves of the elongated skull people. And have any of these been exhumed and studied? Yeah, they started digging here in the 1920s and stopped in the 1960s, so no one's touched them for more than 50 years. And where are the remains of these uh, elongated skull skeletons? Most of them are in the museum at ECO, which we'll see. We were in process of doing an interview with Senior Juan about the burial site when a bureaucrat from the reserve came up and started hassling us about taking pictures. This, in Senor Juan's presence, who was an important figure in Peru, started an argument. We're leaving. We're going. The reserve later apologized to Senor Juan. We headed to the Ica Museum. Yes. from uh, the royal graveyard in the, what is called the Paracas Royal Graveyard. And this is called the Chongo Skull because that area is, is known as Chongos. And we will look at this, and in my opinion, this is definitely not cradle boarding or cranial deformation. There's only one parietal, and this skull is just absolutely enormous. Judd, what's your professional opinion on this? Well, in, in the cases of cradle boarding and cranial deformation that we have. Um, this in terms of proportion of the skull, not just the physical size of mm -hmm. the skulls we've been looking at, but just in terms of the portion of the other parts of the skull. This is the highest dome, skull dome, that, that I've seen thus far. And th this is exceptionally bizarre. The sutures are, are, are also anomalous. Um, it doesn't appear that the that, that there's fusion back here. It appears that there's one parietal plate. Mm -hmm. Very strange. That, that's, that's anomalous. And there's also in the rear of the skull, which is difficult to see, we see sort of that double dome that, that seems it's to be swelling out. only, right. which is sort of indicative of the Paracas skull. I have 
the uh, mold completely on the left side of the skull and uh, the pore spout here. What I have to address now is these cavities in here. I can't just put the mother mold on there because it's hard plaster. So I have to have something that goes in here that I can fill in on all three of these problem areas and the nose. And then those will come out, but they won't be attached to the plaster mother mold necessarily. So that, that allows me to pull the, mold, the mother mold off and pull these pieces out without damaging the skull. Ron, since the last time we talked, there's been some startling and amazing evidence coming out with so-called Sasquatch Bigfoot DNA by Melba Ketchum. Explain that to us, please. Melba has done a forensic DNA analysis of the mm -hmm. Bigfoot uh, piece that they supposedly had. Actually, she had over a hundred different and, samples. And where did the samples come from? All over, but mostly okay. this one main sample come from the Sierra Nevada mountains right. of California. And in that, she has found that the mitochondrial DNA, the maternal side, mm -hmm. is is one hundred percent human. Okay. And the nuclear DNA, that's the mystery. That's the big mystery wow. because it comes from something she can't identify. That some unknown species of hominid. But that creates some real powerful evidence towards uh, substantiating the fact that mm -hmm. Bigfoot does exist. Mm -hmm. Which, because of my encounter, I'm here because of the elongation of the skull. Sure. And I love that because Sasquatch, Bigfoot, what have you, has that elongated skull. Mm -hmm. Not quite to the degree that these uh, things have, but I, I gotta believe that they have not been cradle boarded as some of the, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, these people did. There have been hundreds of accounts of people seeing these. Mm -hmm. Thousands, actually, not just hundreds, but mm -hmm. thousands now. And a lot of them are very, very credible. Now, some of them could be misidentified. But, sure. But these people that say they see them say they have this sagittal crest, this, mm -hmm. this elongated skull. And, and it's just the way it is. And if you, once you get that many people telling you something, there's got to be some cred right. credibility behind sure. it. Sure. first skull is our control sample. It is an Ica skull, and we here we see it is a human skull, at least we believe this is a human skull. We have a frontal plate, two parietals, notice the suture coming back, which divides the parietal into two pieces, and then we have the occipital in the back here. So we believe this is, we're going to use this as our control sample. We will fill the skull with rice and then weigh the skull and also pour the rice out and just see uh, where it is as far as um, unit of measure that way. Here we have the frontal plate, but only one parietal plate. You'll notice that there's no sutures, not even a sign of a suture here. We're gonna take this bag of rice and fill this container, which we know is 625 milliliters. So that gives us a unit of volume. So now we have this entire volume inside the skull, 625 milliliters, and now we'll see how much more of this will fill the skull. As far as I know, it won't take all of this volume, but that's why we're doing this test. Okay, can you shake the skull a little bit? Settle the volume. And again. What I've done thus far is to weigh the, the bulk of the collection, but the weights take into account the entire skull, which includes this portion, the mandible, the teeth, uh, all of the, the bone components of the skull. What we've done is poured rice uh, given the conditions that we have, we poured rice in here to determine volume, to determine what the cranial cavity can actually hold. We need the mass inside the skull. Right, it's more raw data to make the, the right. analyses, the necessary analysis. Okay, so now we're going to pour the rice into the bag and weigh this. All right? That is right. You all right? Great, that's about 9.5, or 0.9. 0.95 kilos. Hovering right around one. Senior Juan's museum is right on a sort of a busy street here in Caracas, so there's a lot of extraneous noise, unfortunately. So bear with us with that.
now we brought our four sample in, so all four are lined up. Again, this skull is a Paraka skull. We believe there was no um, suturing which divides the parietal, so there's only one parietal in this. We're going to pour the rice in and see what we come up with. Number two. Mm. Wow. So this is this is number three now. Part of number three. We'll see how far we get. Thought it never rained in Paracas. Give it a little shake, Mr. Burton. Yeah, go. the contents of skull number four. And it's almost 1.2 kilos. We're simply measuring the rice by itself. Right. So Sample number four might be critical because it's somewhere between 25 and 30 percent greater in terms of weight than the control, and that means also 25 to 30 percent volume difference. Correct. Correct. So that is a very significant very difference. Significant. We left Joe Taylor and Judd Burton in Paracas to finish their work on the skulls while Brian decided the rest of us needed to see the little-known town of Watara. Along the way, we visited Tambo, Colorado, a 15th-century Inca settlement, which gave us clues on how the Incas tended to imitate the ancients. In only a three-hour drive from Paracas, we found ourselves in an entirely different world. Climbing to nearly 9,000 feet, the clouds closing in reinforced the idea that these places actually exist. But the dreamlike surroundings made us all feel we were about to experience something dramatic. Nothing Brian could have told us would have prepared us for what we were about to see. But first, we had to visit a church built on ancient stones that were many thousands of years old. We are in a, a church, but what predates the church, and this is why we came here, is this incredible foundation work. Tell us about the stones and why these are peculiar. Well, according to conventional archaeology, this was an Inca palace or temple. But the thing is that this is mortarless construction. So the Inca tools were only bronze chisels and stone hammers. And so since this wall is five feet thick, there's no mortar or cement in between the stones. Mm -hmm. This is very high tech construction. Very high tech, absolutely. So it's impossible for the Inca to have built this. They would have adopted it and used it. And used it. But this is one of the en enigmatic buildings that we find here and also especially around Cusco mm -hmm. that predates the Inca. But since there was supposedly no civilization prior to the Inca, mm -hmm. we're looking way back in time as to when this was made. It's amazing here. I, the, the stonework, I have never seen any stonework that even comes close to what we're looking at here now. Notice the joints here, the precision joints, and the complex of angles. These, these are masters, masters of stonework. Again, this wall is at least five feet thick through that way. There's no hollow in it. Every one of these stones fits together with a precision whereby you can't fit a human hair in between. We could achieve this today, but it would be incredibly expensive and incredibly time consuming. So how could some so-called primitive civilization mm -hmm. in the past have done this? And like what you were saying, is that this is similar to what you see in Egypt. Mm -hmm. And the Egyptologists insist that everything in Egypt was built by the pharaohs, but what we see here and in Egypt and all over the world is the adoption of older structures. A few blocks away from the church was a museum. The main exhibit stunned all of us. Three mummified examples of what may have been a mother and her two babies, all with elongated heads. 
Shocked at the amazing condition of this find, Irene interpreted for us as we asked the director of the museum how old these mummies were. He said they were about 3,000 years old. This is close to the same age of some of the skulls we examined in Paracas. Any known disease such as hydrocephaly or water on mm -hmm. the brain, yes. that creates a beach ball effect. Not this. Not this vertical cone head look, which is akin to what we saw in Paracas mm -hmm. amongst the, the largest of the Paracas skulls. So this, uh, this being or this person is very unique in my six years of exploring the subject. And the fact that it's on display is remarkable, but not so remarkable when you take into account the fact that this museum is in the middle of nowhere. Cusco, a land where people are living around ancient structures every day. At 11,200 feet above sea level, Cusco provided the largest physical challenge yet, as we felt lightheaded and underpowered the first few days. But little did we realize, Cusco was the beginning for us of putting the pieces together about what may have happened during a time of Noah and the giants. So much has been lost. We felt drawn to these mammoth structures of stone and the technologies that were obviously behind their creation and use. But what did it all mean? Tell us why a bronze chisel would not be able to duplicate this. Well, bronze is a lot softer than this stone. This stone is six and a half to seven out of 10 in hardness, with 10 being diamond. Bronze is three and a half to four in hardness. So it would be the equivalent of trying to cut down a tree with a plastic knife. <laughs> the tool, if the tool is softer than the material, it simply can't do anything. And that's what the great mystery is of this wall as well as Saxe Waman, which we will see. Mm -hmm. It almost looks like the stone was molded into shape, as if the ancient builders were able to soften the stone almost to the consistency of marshmallows, and then push them into place, and turn off whatever machine it was they were using, and then just continually move down and up in order to, to construct it. Because in a lot of cases... Uh, that's unbelievable. The joinery is so tight that you can't fit a human hair in between. And this wall is six feet thick. And, and, and to complicate this, the wall is not, is not vertical, straight up and down, 90 degrees from, let's say, a, a flat base. The wall is leaning um, at a slight angle as it goes up for mm -hmm. stability. Right. So now you've got even more complex angles. And if we, you know, look, look at this. I mean, there's nothing, there's nothing square or level about any of this. Every stone is polygonal. Every stone has its own particular peculiar shape. Yeah, every single stone is a different shape and size. And what we'll see when we go around the corner is that the builders went one step above that and they created pictograms of animals in the walls wow. as well, like a jigsaw puzzle. Mm -hmm. Amazing. So that requires planning and design, whereas conventional archaeology simply says that they found, that find a stone that was of approximate shape, shape it and put it into place, but they don't take into account the design system which is inherent in this wall and others. Well, the important thing is that they call this pre-Inca, but this is Inca. You know, the stuff before the Inca is better. The stuff after the Inca is worse. Um, so you're going from the finest craftsmanship being the oldest craftsmanship. The worst craftsmanship is the more recent, which is counter to what conventional archaeology or even the so-called history of humanity is, that supposedly we start from being very primitive to the so-called sophisticated nature that we're at now. But any ancient society will tell you that cultures go in waves. They crest, then they crash, then they crest, then they crash. Atlantis being the ultimate example, so-called Atlantis. But the important point is that in this corner, this little corner of 100 square feet, we have the megalithic on the bottom. This stone came from 30 kilometers away, every stone is super heavy, in some cases multi-tons. Above that, you have Inca repair work. 
And then above that still, you have where the Spanish recycled an Inca building, and that's on top of the Inca work. And then even higher, you have colonial Spanish. So you have the entire history of Cusco given an example of in this wall from the bottom to the top. After examining the stones in Cusco, the next day we headed out to Titicaca, a high altitude trek hovering above Cusco around the 12,000 foot level. We were all gasping for air as we entered this mysterious cave on a mountain with interior domes carved out and polished surfaces and steps that looked like they had been machined. All the while water dripped continuously from all the surfaces. Everything we touched was wet or muddy. But underlying all of this was a spectacular piece of ancient engineering. And no one seemed to know who created it. I'm here with Senior Jesus Gamala inside this incredible structure. There are, there are two domes here. Senior Jesus, what, what is this place? Uh, this place is Titicaca, and this is the inner of the two domes and convert in this seat. And this is very old, very old, the, the first culture, Hanabacha. Okay. And this looks like it has split apart, that something caused this, these rocks to split apart. An earthquake, maybe? Something catastrophic? Uh, maybe. Well, Brian, here we see it very, very clearly the, the cut marks in, in the stone. And again, feeling this is a, a highly polished surface. Yeah, and the other point is that someone could say, well, that's natural because that's the grain of the stone. But what counters that argument is the fact that we can see the cutter going this way yes, too. Yes. So it's almost perpendicular to that surface. And there's a lot of evidence in this cave, more so than possibly anywhere that I know of around Cusco, where we see the direct evidence of a machine at work and not a modern machine because we're pretty far away from any electrical plug. Sure, sure. And there'd be no sense for anyone to come in here and be shaping stone in modern times. And this reaches back far into antiquity, maybe pre-flood for all we know. Well, and according to Senior Jesus Gamara, who we have with us today, uh -huh. he talks about this kind of workmanship as being from the first period. Okay. And this is definitely, according to him, and my belief, antediluvian. Well, well, also you see where the tool did an overcut, where it yes. got deeper into yes. the stone than it had to, and that gives us an idea of the dimensions of the actual cutting blade, which is astonishing. And here, you can see it. Yeah, and it seems to have polished it as it was cutting, uh -huh. Uh -huh. but there's no way that was done by hand tools. Mm -hmm. The thing is, the actual tunnel entrance is around to the left. Is it really? That's why the stone is called the Chincana. It doesn't refer to the stone, it refers to the entrance to the tunnel. And we know for sure, we have an eyewitness who entered the tunnel in 1994. And? He said there was 160 stairs that go down, and then it continues on, and it's easily high enough to walk through. But it's so dark, and then it branches into a labyrinth. And so the Peruvian government sealed it off because people have literally entered and not come back. What we do know from the oral tradition and other some of the chronicles is that the tunnel entrance here goes down underneath Cusco and comes up at the Coricancha. That well that we were not allowed to stand in exactly. a, a couple of days ago. Exactly. Yes. So the question is, obviously the Inca didn't make it because it's solid bedrock. This is the entrance of the tunnel or chincana that connects Sacsayhuaman with the center of Cusco. This is one from the Arak culture um, according to Jesus Gamarra's father, Señor Alfredo Gamarra. They belong to the first war. These are potatoes. I grow potatoes in my garden. Yeah. Yeah, I recognize the plant.
There is indigenous rock, which is found here at Sacsay Waman. And then there is other stone, which is andrasite. And the question is, where did this andrasite, these huge megalithic boulders, originate from? Where were they quarried? Señor Jesus, where did these stones come from? How far away? Las leyendas incas dicen According to the Inca legends, they were brought from Yucay and Muina. Yucay is 72 kilometers away, and Muina, 45 kilometers away. This is the indigenous rock of the area, and this is limestone. The stones that build these walls are andrasite. So we have a real problem, because this andrasite stone comes from 40 miles away in one direction which begs the question, how does an ancient culture, maybe without the wheel, move cyclically in blocks, some of them weighing as much as 125 tons? So not only were these stones hauled 40 miles plus, but they also came from an elevation about 2,000 feet lower than what you see here. It truly is enigmatic. And being a frank supernaturalist, I look to the supernatural. Is it possible, is it possible that this is the handiwork of fallen angels? and the progeny, the Nephilim. Well, the thing is, I've read, as far as I know, every Spanish chronicle and the only Inca chronicle that exists. And no one can say, even archaeologists can't say who made these. The stone is far too big for human, you know, just physical labor to move them, especially from 40 miles away. And so some of the accounts state that when the Spanish first arrived up here at Sacsayhuaman, they were stupefied. And they asked the Inca, they said, did you build this? And the Inca said, no, these were made by the giants long before us. And I think we're definitely looking at a mysterious culture of incredible sophistication existing long before history into what is called prehistory. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It may have been the Nephilim. Sure. That theory is as strong as any other. So. That's more. That's where we, uh, where we are with this, and it's not only at Sacsayhuaman. You find it also at Machu Picchu. You find it in the city of Cusco, and at all the major megalithic sites um, and so-called Inca sites in and around Cusco. You find these megalithic stones, precision accuracy in terms of putting them together uh -huh. by an unknown race. the site of Saxe Waman and it's it's a mystery we're very high up in the mountains here and we see this this megalithic work this stone work with fairly um, look like right angles to me and, and the corners are shaped and it, it sort of begs the question why what why come here to do this same technology that we've seen now and it's like the machines in there just kind of going shh. Yeah. This is the Sun Gate and uh, it's extremely ancient and what we see of course is um, the Inca stonework but certainly the precision is there. It's just really incredible to see. Based on this this number this is perfectly plumb so this wall is 90 degrees to the surface of the, of, of the land. And so it shows that uh, whoever built this knew how to make something perfectly level on a vertical plane. It's a bit of a guess, but still it's like point, point 0.2 of one degree off perfect, uh, perfectly flat level. We had driven out of Cusco to visit new locations a few hours away. Our ultimate destination was Oyente Tambo, where we planned to visit the Temple of the Sun and also search the surrounding areas for artifacts. On our way, we had heard of the Waki skulls at a private museum headed up by Senior Renato. He was very, very helpful. 
To facilitate a better view of the creature he unearthed from the nearby mountains, at our request, he was kind enough to remove the glass case surrounding it, and what we saw was incredible. See, so Renato, where did this this um, skeleton come from? Where did you find it? ¿Dónde encontró a Waiki, señor Renato? Ah, él fue encontrado en una montaña que está al frente de este pueblo. Oh. Igor found in Huiracochang, which is a mountain across from Andahuay Villas. Uh, it's also a place where uh, a lot of meteorites have been fall down in that area. So is this cranial deformation, head cradle boarding? ¿Hay una deformación craniana en Waiki? No, no es deformación craniana. Porque For the characteristics of Waiki, it's not a cranial deformation. Mm -hmm. It's natural. Mm -hmm. It's natural. And you are an anthropologist. Es usted un antropólogo. Sí, antropólogo. And you're not, you're not, is this human in your opinion? ¿Es humano en su opinión? No, no es humano. No es humano porque tiene la fontanela abierta. For all the characteristics, Waiki is not a human being. He has 11 ribs, hair and bones are big, and also the socks of the eyes are big, more bigger than the human beings, and the nose um, is um, very different. So it's different in every possible way, including from the chin. This is not, uh, this is not a hoax. It's not, you didn't make this, it's not a hoax, no one found, it's not a prop. This came out of the graveyard. O sea, eso usted no lo ha recreado, o sea, no lo ha formado, es algo que usted encontró en una de las tumbas en Huiracochamba. Sí, 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 se encontró en una tumba y así le hemos traído y está tal como, como se le encontró él. It was found in a gra graveyard and he just brought it here. He didn't touch, he didn't okay. do anything. How many fingers? How many, how many fingers on the hand? Any, any way of knowing that? ¿Cuántos dedos de la mano tienen? Eso es lo que no sabemos porque no tenía manos y tampoco mm. los pies. Oh, that's Wasn't that's there. unknown because we didn't have hands. She didn't. Oh, mm -hmm. she didn't have hands. No. Mm -hmm. Are there any more of these up at the mountain? Hay más guaykis en la montaña, in the mountain. No sabemos si hay más. Se supone que debe haber posiblemente de acuerdo a los datos que que hemos conseguido, pero es muy grande la montaña para buscar. ¿no? Mm -hmm. We don't know for sure. It's a very big mountain. More likely there are more. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Senor Renato. No, gracias Thank a usted. Thank you so much. Muchas gracias. Gracias, gracias a usted. So here we have uh, these two skulls, which in my opinion are very anomalous. We see uh, what, it, what appears to be a suture in the frontal plate. And we know from a control sample that a normal human being does not have the suture. Notice the one here. These are not cracks in the skull. These are, in fact, sutures. Next stop was Moray, an ancient Inca site. The roads turned to dirt as we wound our way to higher elevations, sometimes with slim margins between us and other travelers. Even so, the trip allowed us to experience some incredibly beautiful farmland. Moray is believed to be an agricultural site where they could test growing plants at different altitudes. The left side was damaged by a flood in 2009. We continued on through other little towns to our next destination, Oyen Tambo. The river was at flood stage and causing problems in the town. We took three-wheeled taxis to our hotel. Some of the land was starting to collapse. The train station and several houses were at risk. Water and power were out, so we had to make do by flushing the toilets with river water. But we were now close to several locations we wanted to see, starting with the Temple of the Sun. We had no idea how powerful this location would become. This stone is granite, and it's not local. It comes from across the valley and up the side of a mountain, which we'll see. Mm -hmm. That's the quarry site. The little flecks of white 
that you see in the stone is quartz. Mm -hmm. So it's highly piezoelectric. And so this stone was selected specifically to construct the Great Sun Temple, which we'll see up there. Some of those blocks are 40 tons plus. Um, and the conventional story is that the Inca were building the Sun Temple and then for some mysterious reason abandoned the construction. But I think there was a massive cataclysm sure. that destroyed it. And so some of these multi-ton blocks like this one tumbled down from the top to the present location. And the Inca who adopted this site couldn't use stone like this, so that's why it's been sitting like this for probably thousands of years. Amazing. The Inca built the entire network of other uh, terraces and things around the Sun Temple. But we'll see very obviously that uh, Inca construction is very different and I have to say inferior to the work of the megalithic builders, yeah. which is what that whole area is up there. This is a resonator. Unbelievable. Go. <laughs> And this is um, remarkable here because, we're, in my opinion, as you have pointed out, this seems to be a, a telltale mark of some kind of a machine that is cut into the rock and left a very exact line. Tell us about that, please. Well, the thing is, most people will look at that and say that's a flaw, like a crack in the mm -hmm. stone. Or a grain of quartz or a yeah. of quartz like this over here. Yeah, but this, this is a vein of quartz. Right. And you can see that's not a straight line. Right. You know, that's... It's weaving in and out. Sure. But if you look straight down this one, what you will notice is that the continuity of the width is very precise. It's as if one cutting tool went through, but it isn't a saw because what you notice at places like this and further over like that and here, mm -hmm. that there's a jog, like the tool had to make some kind of correction. Um, and it wasn't cutting very deep because with putting this card in, it's only going in between an eighth and a quarter of an inch. But down at this point, this is where it goes in a lot deeper. Interesting. Uh, so engineers I've showed this to more or less state that they think that this is con some kind of tool. How did they move a 40 ton block of stone to this position? Not only that, Look at how this has been precisely carved out. And the joint down here is seamless, literally seamless. And because this is sloughed off from thousands of years of weathering, you can feel the polished surface of the granite. Brian, tell us about this, please. Well, this is probably the finest example of joinery in Peru, mm -hmm. because this block, which is at least 12 to 14 feet long, fits perfectly, and I mean perfectly, on top of the blocks below and straight through three feet to the other side. Amazing. You can't fit a human hair in that join. <clears throat> Today we could possibly create a join like that, but you would need a massive saw that had zero vibration to it. It couldn't, the saw blade couldn't, couldn't move back and forth at all. Sure. Because this is a seamless fit. We're here at the Temple of the Sun. The vantage point is incredible here. And behind me are, are, are granite blocks, which are about 40 tons each. And the workmanship here is, is just spectacular. In my opinion, what we are looking at is Nephilim architecture. In other words, I believe that this is the handiwork of the giants, of the Nephilim. And then a great cataclysm, something happened, which toppled the temple, just like we see in the ancient world all of the ancient sites and different continents. Something happened and destroyed what was here. The reason why this wall is still somewhat intact is that there is earth behind it. Uh -huh. And in the front too, it's the same thing. The wall has been packed into the earth. So a major earthquake or other catastrophe, which I'm sure happened here many thousands of years ago, caused the sides to explode. 
and that's why all the way down the hill that way and that way we find massive megalithic shape blocks that belonged here. Yeah, yeah. What people talk about in terms of these, they say that these were like earthquake shims, that this helped to keep this wall more or less intact during this ancient cataclysm. There's no way the Inca built this. It's The Inca were a great civilization, but the size of the blocks, the fact that they were quarried not simply across the valley, but across the valley and several thousands of feet up in a quarry which is almost in the clouds, is Herculean. Yes, it is. That is the work of Titans. Yeah. And so I think this is one of the best remnants we have in Peru and the Americas of the existence of a highly sophisticated culture with technology superior to ours. Mm -hmm. And the remnants remain for us to ponder over. At the Temple of the Condor, we found these huge thrones cut into the stone. Were these there for the giants, like the ancient Egyptian gods? And again, we see evidence of trapezoidal shapes cut in stone. Were these there to tune these structures for some reason? Their continued use seemed to be more significant than simply decoration. there may be skulls we could find in a cave in the area. Irene spoke with a shop owner that seemed to know something about it. We had sketchy details, but we took a chance and hired a couple of taxis. The driver went as far as he could go. The rest of the distance would have to be on foot. We had hoped the river might subside. It continued to rush at an accelerated rate. We headed in the general direction that Irene described. Along the way, we asked some of the locals if they knew anything about this burial site and where it was. The hike, which took us through pastures with cows and horses, ended in a trek through some dense brush. Suddenly, a boy emerged in the brush and warned Richard about the cactus in the area. Espina. Oh, what is that? Cactus? Oh, grasses. Show me. It had long spines that would go right through your clothes. Irene found a woman that thought she remembered some caves in the area. And there it was. Okay. No. She said when she as a child she remembered seeing the bones, but she doesn't know if the archaeologists have come and taken to the museums. It's really deep, very deep. Very deep. It was deep and dark, and we couldn't see without going inside. Brian was the first to go in, followed by LA using a camera light to see. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. While watching this, Ron accidentally backed into one of those cactus. The spine went deep into his leg, and the boy helped by pulling it out. 
but in the process got stuck himself. Cactus. Golly. There was nothing in the cave. Nothing in there, Brian? Nothing. We don't. don't even ask me. We don't. I want it, I want a cave with bones. As rugged as the surroundings were at this high elevation, flowers and plants of all kinds were growing. Everywhere, there were wildflowers and greenery. Climbing over unstable rocks was very tough. We found a second cave, but it also was empty. Having no more clues, we headed back through the brush to the nearby town to rest. The woman found a young man named Abel. He thought he knew of another cave where bones might be found. It meant we'd have to do the whole thing over again. This picturesque village had dwellings made of stone, some with dirt floors. There was a dog on every porch. We headed back a different way, through pastures and beside the raging river. Trekking through the brush again, a bell led us to a cluster of caves. There, in the largest of the two, was a burial site with visible bones. That's not a giant, but it's much bigger than the Inca. Yeah, the Inca were very small. That's the important thing, is you have to be able to, you know, there are different one from a two parietal. Abel kept bringing out more bones for us. Another one? Mm -hmm. I got it right here, Brian. Great. Show it to me. Okay, well, this. Yeah, por favor. Uh, femur, if possible. So this is definitely an example of cranial deformation, but the shape is very different from the Paraca skulls. This is more like what one could even call the Inca, the Inca style, because it's more of a horizontal deformation than vertical. But what's curious about this skull is the fact that it does have four cranial plates, <coughs> excuse me, whereas a normal skull only has three. This one should not be there. And in the back, it does have the little holes that we saw in Paracas. Now, some people might find this a morbid. A little macabre. And they also may find it as being an offensive thing to do. But what actually we're going to do is we're returning the skeletal material back to, back into the tomb collectively together. Um, we are not archaeologists, so we're not allowed to take samples away. But what we're doing is, is we're doing what few other people do and that's actually record these and build a database not only uh, a Peru based one but a global base of, of where these are found what the shapes look like and the anomalous characteristics over here Abel says he's found a larger one okay. Okay. Here you are. right the whole skeleton down here uh, this looks very ancient. I have no idea how old it is, but it is uh, very oh, ancient. Mean, no. Mas, mas huesos? Sí. Yeah. Sí. The camino. Uh, we we we're, we're standing in a tomb. There are there are bones here. Um, I have no idea. We didn't find any elongated skulls. Not not in this area, but right next door we did find the elongated skull. So. This was sealed off with adobe at one time to hide it from people. So where you find one tomb, you're liable to find more in the same area. The flat thing is over there. It's right there. Oh. So there's the deformation in the Lo and behold, there were skeletons here. Very ancient place. Um, here we've got a skull that you can see. It, it's definitely cranial deformation. What makes this one interesting is it's back this way, elongated this way. But again, we see two frontal plates rather than the one that is normal. And these are sutures. So this is an anomalous skull. We are about to rebury these. Uh, when I say rebury, right. they were they were placed in the cave. We didn't dig them up or anything. They were in the cave. And so we're going to uh, put them back where we found them. Fascinating. And the reason why we're doing this, if there's genetic manipulation going on here, 
thousands of years ago by entities which, were, which we don't know. People need to see this and understand that this is the proof of genetic manipulation. Our trip ended with the discovery that elongated skulls can still be found in Peru. We actually found one ourselves, a nice way to end our trip. As we left Tambo and returned to Cusco overnight, all of the information we had discovered on the trip started to come together. Oddly, it started to make sense. nerve is a uh, standard human. Uh, these are the two nasal bones. They're not very prominent and they're also fused, which means again this is an older individual. So this is not a nose that protrudes from the face okay. because your nose nasal bones are right here. Okay. See how it protrudes? Oh wow, yes. So this is a flattened the flattened face. The hair itself was um, was red, and it appeared to be natural. Uh, there was no indication of any kind of a dye. And um, this was under uh, light microscopy, and then under Raman spectroscopy, uh, we saw no indication of, of dye either. Um, uh, a control hair, um, human hair, and um, the um, mummy hair had the same uh, Raman chemical frequency peaks. Um, indicating that there probably was no dye used. Uh, certainly to the eye under light microscopy it looked natural. It's a very uh, high brow and um, of course the distance between here and would be here is elongated. Mm -hmm. This is flattened, this is flattened, this is elongated and this is a protuberance. Perhaps they were some sort of hybrids, um, so it's hard to say, but uh, they certainly didn't look completely human. The little flecks of white that you see in the stone is quartz. Mm -hmm. So it's highly piezoelectric. Piezoelectric stone might um, be used as part of such a power system. Um, gravitational energy could be changed into electrical energy, high voltage electrical energy, and, and possibly funnel through the earth by a pyramid type structure. Perhaps all these uh, buildings were made of the same type of material and tuned to pick up on uh, the resonant frequencies uh, transmitted through the earth. Tesla had a system like that back um, around the turn of the last century, and it was never used um, because uh, J.P. Morgan wanted to make sure that everybody paid for their electricity. You've seen evidence of the skulls that might have been related to the Nephilim, an unknown race that apparently existed which had a very different cranial anatomy. Modern science refuses to address it. One doctor, after examining our cast of the Paracas skull, made this comment. Someone would have a very difficult time convincing me that this is a human skull. It has too many bizarre abnormalities. And notice only one parietal plate on the top. You also saw how there was a super intelligence and unknown technology involved in creating the megalithic structures. They were using techniques that we would be hard pressed to duplicate today. The remains of these structures have endured for thousands of years and remain plumb when measured with electronic instruments. What purpose did the giants in these megalithic sites have? There is evidence that a majority of ancient structures were at that time in alignment with the constellations. Recent information about the pyramids seem to indicate that they may have been sophisticated machines possibly used to generate energy. These ancient structures may have been part of a worldwide grid. There is also evidence that some type of cataclysmic event happened which destroyed this grid, as Brian alluded to. Was the flood of Noah responsible for this? The time of Noah is differentiated from any other time in history by the presence of the Nephilim on Earth, as well as unprecedented levels of violence. Now in the 21st century, a grid of satellites wrap around the world. With them, we can track the weather, navigate planes in flight, communicate to any point on Earth, spy on people walking down the street. As you saw in Watchers 5, Dr. Brooks Agnew shared with us the potential of heart to control the weather and even create earthquakes. People are becoming uneasy today as the world seems to be moving in a disturbing direction. Could we be seeing a rebirth of the same ideas happening all over again? Are we living in a time which is similar to the days of Noah? One thing's for certain, we'll be watching.